It was a couple of years ago on a Sabbath morning that I was visiting with a family friend of ours, and some of you have heard this story before. We weren't going to be going to church this day because his wife wasn't feeling well, and everyone else was still in bed, and we were there just kind of discussing things, and and he looked at me and he said, Jim, I know you're a pastor, and I know I really shouldn't say this to you, but he said, I got to get this off of my heart. He said, I used to consider myself a tried and true, died in the wool, Seventh day Adventist Christian. But he said, I can't say that anymore. This man has been an elder in the Boulder Church down in Colorado for decades, literally, the head elder for a long period of time. And he said, I've come to the place in my life where I can only say this about who I am. I am a poor old sinner saved by the grace of God. And I wondered what he was saying. And so I asked him, what is behind this? And he said, I've been watching over the last several years all of my friends from the Boulder Church there growing old and ultimately passing away. And he said, without fail, the majority, majority of them are going to their graves wondering if they have done enough good things to be in God's kingdom. Is that any way to spend the last years of your life Worrying if you have done enough good. And he said, I've been asking some questions to figure out why so many people are in that place. And he had come to this conclusion. He said, Jim, it is because of the way that most of our members perceive that we teach the sanctuary that somehow God is up there and has been since 1844 looking down on his people and almost in a Santa Claus-like way looking to find who's been naughty and who's been nice. And he said, I cannot live in that kind of a thought process any longer. He said, I've come to the place where I can only focus on the grace of Jesus Christ. Because in my heart and mind, I will have never done enough good, nor can I do enough good to be in God's kingdom. And I don't want to spend my remaining days asking that question in my mind. Now, some of you here today are thinking right away, well, he just misunderstands what we teach about the sanctuary. I'm sure glad I do. If you are one of those sitting there thinking that thought today, I have some pretty difficult words for you. You need to come to understand the love of Jesus in your heart. Because if you know there are people around you who are struggling with that in their hearts, it should affect your heart. That is no way for a Christian who knows what Jesus Christ has done for them to be living their lives. And you might be thinking, well, I'm sure glad there's nobody like that in the Bozeman church. Well, again, wrong answer. I've been in some of your homes. I have heard those very discussions. And since that time with my family friend a couple of years ago, God has laid on my heart the need to go back and look at God's sanctuary. What it teaches us. And so today we begin a series on the sanctuary, and we're going to go back to the very beginning. 
our scripture reading today, build me a sanctuary that I may come and do what? Dwell with you. In that short little verse, we find the very heart of God. That God wants to be with who? With us. I find that so reassuring in my heart today. I find that so reassuring when I understand in my life there is nothing to merit a place with God. I find it reassuring that there is a God who desires to be with me. This verse shows the love of God for each one of you today, for each one of us. God's ultimate desire is He wants to be with you. And He tells Moses that the sanctuary is all about me wanting to be with you. Build me a place, Moses, so I can be with my people. As Moses wrote that verse, he not only told us God's plan to build a sanctuary, but in verse 9 that Linda read for us this morning, God also gave them a blueprint, didn't he? Build me a sanctuary and build it how? After the pattern. Now it's an interesting thing because Moses could have said, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. According to the pattern of the sanctuary that I am going to give you. But did you listen carefully this morning to recognize that Moses doesn't use the word sanctuary when it comes to the pattern? Moses used the word what? Tabernacle. I am so glad that you are listening to our scripture reading. Because we don't use it just to fill up a couple minutes of our service. It is a vital, important part of our service. It leads us to where we're going. Build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you. Build it, make it after the pattern of the tabernacle that I am giving you. The word sanctuary simply means that it is a place that is consecrated to be sacred and holy. This place, by God's grace, is consecrated to be a sacred and holy place where we can come and be in whose presence? The very presence of God. And God has promised He will be here with us. But the word tabernacle simply means dwelling place. And in this particular verse, the dwelling place of who? Of God. And we're not going to take time to do it today, but you can go to your Bibles and go back to the book of Hebrews when it's talking about the sanctuary that God told Moses to build. And it says, build it after the pattern of the tabernacle that is located where? In heaven. And so if we insert that knowledge into Exodus... 25 verses 8 and 9, we find that God is saying, build me a sanctuary after the pattern of the heavenly dwelling place of who? Of God. So today, we want to learn about God's dwelling place. And if this earthly dwelling place is to be patterned after God's heavenly dwelling place, perhaps the place to start is God's heavenly sanctuary. Did you know that there is a sanctuary in heaven? There is. It is a place where God tabernacles, the place where He dwells. A couple of passages we are going to begin with today, ones that we typically use for something entirely different than this. The first one in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 28, and we want to begin in verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 28, and we'll start with verse 12. If you're following along in your pew Bible today, that's page 848. 
848, Ezekiel chapter 28, and we'll begin with verse 12, and we're going to pick it up about halfway through here. And we know these verses ultimately are speaking, there's kind of a dual form to it here, but we're looking at Lucifer in heaven. And in this case, we will find that it is before sin or the fall in heaven. And we begin again about halfway through verse 12. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. And the thing we want to grab a hold of out of here that is very important, you were in where? You were in Eden. Now, when you think of Eden, what is the first thing that comes to your mind? Are you thinking heaven or earth? We usually think earth, aren't we? We're thinking about earth. We're thinking about creation. But in Ezekiel 28, we need to pay close attention here because it's talking about Lucifer in heaven, and we're going to find out it is before something happens, and it says that he is in Eden, the garden of God. Verse 13, every precious stone adorned you, ruby, topaz, emerald, chrysolite, onyx, jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold on the day you were created they were prepared. Verse 14, you were anointed as a guardian what? Cherub. We ever seen that wording in scripture before? Where do we see a guardian cherub? Well, if we're thinking about the sanctuary, and hopefully you are now because we've talked about the fact that we should be thinking about it this morning, you will find that the guardian cherub is with the ark in the most holy place of the sanctuary. So some sanctuary language beginning to appear here. You were the anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created until what happened? Until wickedness was found in you. And the end of verse 16 says, So I drove you in disgrace from the mount of God. I expelled you, O guardian cherub, from among the fiery stones. We are seeing a picture of something in heaven that is referred to here as a garden that is named Eden, where Lucifer was, and it's in the presence of the mount of who? The mount of God. And we see language here that Lucifer was actually a covering cherub. If we're thinking along sanctuary terms, our minds could be thinking along the lines that perhaps this mount of God, the mountain of God we see here is his dwelling place, his throne place. And Eden, heaven's sanctuary. Could that be what we're reading about here in Ezekiel 28? Well, let's go back to another passage that is familiar to us um, for Lucifer's time in heaven, back to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 12 to 14, just a few books before Ezekiel here, page 689. And we're on Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 12 to 14. Isaiah chapter 14, we'll begin here in verse 12. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn, you have been cast down to the earth, you who once laid low the nations. And then we want to begin paying attention here. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of who? Of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. So he is wanting whose position? We can see it already. He's wanting God's position. He is wanting God's throne position. And we see here that that is on the mount of what? The mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountain. And again, we remember that the sanctuary is a place that is consecrated as what? Sacred or holy. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds and I will make myself like the Most High. In Lucifer's mind, to become like the Most High, he had to take whose place? God's place. And to take God's place, he had to literally take God's dwelling place that was on the mount. Here it says the mountain of assembly. 
Obviously, Isaiah and Ezekiel are talking about the same place. This heavenly Eden is where Lucifer wanted to ascend to the very throne of God to be where God was dwelling in heaven. And then just flip back a few pages in Isaiah, we will kind of complete a picture here. Isaiah chapter 2, and we want to look at verse 2. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, and remembering this is a mount of assembly that we just read about in Isaiah. If there is an assembly around this mountain, what would we gather would be there? What is an assembly made of? It's people, right? And so we notice that and we read here in verse 2 of Isaiah chapter 2, in the last days the mountain of the Lord's temple will be established. The mountain of the Lord's what? Interesting, isn't it? God's dwelling place, His mountain is referred to in Isaiah 2 here as a what? As a temple, it is a sanctuary, it is the place of God's dwelling. And it goes on to say, as it's established as chief among the mountains, it will be raised above the hills And all nations will do what? Stream to it. They will come and they will assemble in the very presence of who? Of God. So in this picture of heaven, we see Eden. And we see God's dwelling place. The mountain of God, the mount of assembly. And we get a picture here that this is the heavenly sanctuary. Now, I want us to go back here to the book of Genesis now. And we are going to look at something interesting because as we mentioned earlier, when we think of Eden, we think of creation. And we want to go to Genesis chapter 2. And we want to look at verse 8, Genesis chapter 2, first book of our Bibles here, and verse 8. And it says, Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in where? In Eden. Instantly we see God has planted something in creation, hasn't he? And it is a garden, it is in fact what? Eden. God has planted Eden in creation. Could it be that in creation God so desired to be with His people that He brought a heavenly sanctuary and placed it here on this earth to be the first earthly sanctuary? Could it be, at the very least, this Eden is patterned after the Eden in heaven, if not the same. Richard Davidson is the professor of Old Testament interpretation at Andrews University, and he has written a dissertation on earth's first sanctuary. I want to read a few quotes from that. We'll begin with this one. The Eden garden described in Ezekiel 28.13 must be the heavenly, not earthly Eden, because the covering cherub was present there before he sinned, before he was expelled from heaven to this earth, as we read. Ezekiel 28 thus takes us back to the existence of the heavenly Eden sanctuary before the planting of the garden Eden sanctuary on earth. Just as the latter earthly tabernacle in the wilderness was built as a copy of the heavenly original, so earth's first sanctuary The earthly Garden of Eden was created by God as a copy of the original heavenly sanctuary, and this is confirmed by the narrator of Genesis chapters 2 and 3 by using the exact same phraseology, Garden of Eden, as employed by Ezekiel in describing the original heavenly sanctuary. Davidson proposes a connection between heaven and earth. That Garden of Eden on this earth at creation was patterned after the heavenly sanctuary. Well, that's nice to know that he is saying that and he is proposing that. But where does he get that from? How do we jump from heaven to earth? Is there evidence in the Bible 
that would lead us in that direction. Now, we don't have enough time today, nor would we in two Sabbaths to go over everything that he has studied and written in this dissertation. It goes all the way from the separating of the firmament in the very beginning of creation in using the same Hebrew language as in the veil that's in the temple, the mist that watered the garden that rose up to the skies being the same language, the same verbs as in the smoke of incense that rose in the temple to before God, the tree of life itself representing the ark of God and the language that is used, the very place where God, God dwelled. And there's a lot of things there that he goes over and over. The, the laver where the water was, the word sea for that is the same as that as we find in the sanctuary. Over and over again, we see some things. And again, we don't have time to go through all of those. But I want to look at a few of the things that point directly to the heavenly sanctuary in the language that we saw in Ezekiel and Isaiah. So in Genesis again, we want to look now at Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 10. And notice what it says here. A river watering the garden flowed from even Eden, and it was separated into four headwaters. All right, so we see a river that is flowing from where? Eden. Okay? Now, we're going to just use a little bit of logic in our minds today. A river flows which direction? Up or down? I'll give you a hint. <laughs> Water very rarely flows uphill, right? So this river is flowing downhill and separating into four other rivers. That would indicate that the Garden of Eden was in an elevated position. The Mount of God that we read of in Ezekiel and Isaiah was an elevated position. It was the mountain of God. It was his dwelling place. Here we see Eden is evidently elevated because the water is flowing from Eden. Again, we'll just read quickly here a quote from Richard Davidson. The Genesis 2 creation account implies that the Garden of Eden was placed in an elevated position. A mountain that the four rivers flow from had a common source. And it seems possible only if the rivers are flowing downward from an elevated mountain location. Now we can say, okay, well that all sounds good, but how can we come to some evidence of this in, in the Bible? And again, we want to go back to Ezekiel now, chapter 47, and focus in on the river itself. Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 1, and then we're going to jump down and read verse 12. Ezekiel chapter 47 and we'll read verse 1. By the way, that's page 870, 870 in your pew Bible. Ezekiel chapter 47, and we'll begin here with verse 1, and then we're going to jump down and read verse 12. It says there, The man brought me back to the entrance of the what? Of the temple. And I saw what coming from the temple? I saw water coming from out of under the threshold of the temple toward the east. Language very similar to what we just read in Genesis. Then we jump down to verse 12. There's a description between verse 1 and 12 of the river as it gets deeper the farther you go. And the farther it goes, there is more life that is introduced into the picture of this river. But we come to verse 12, and this language is very, very interesting. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. Now, if you have ever read the book of Revelation and you get to the end of Revelation, you recognize what was just said here. This is describing a picture we see in Revelation where the river of life is flowing from the throne of God and the tree of life on either side and its fruit for the healing of the nations, right? This is a sanctuary picture. This is a picture of God's heavenly sanctuary. It's a picture of what Eden was. River flowing, its source from the very throne of God. And its waters for the what? Healing of the nations. A beautiful picture, isn't it? 
we go back into Genesis, we see that this Mount of God, the very presence, dwelling place of God, the river flows from there, breaking into four branches that water God's creation. Let's go back to Genesis. We're just going to look at a couple of more here. Genesis chapter 2 again. And we're going to look at this time at verse 15. Genesis chapter 2 and verse 15. And we just notice the very beginning part of it here. It says, The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. Now, we're not going to go into it, but those words work and take care of or dress and keep if you have the King James are important words because if you go into the sanctuary teachings in the rest of Scripture, you will find that those two verbs identically are always used in describing the work of the priest and the Levites in the temple. So that's one thing, and we're not going to go into all of that today, but I want us just to notice the very first part. It says, the Lord God took man and did what? It says he put him in the garden. Okay? There are, are words that we have for put in the Bible. One of them would be Pastor Jim went and he put his Bible on this stand. I placed it there. I said it there. Moses could have simply used that word to say God put man in the garden and it would have been perfectly fine. But Moses doesn't use that word. Moses uses another word that isn't used overly often in the Old Testament, but he uses a word that Richard Davidson will describe to us now. And listen carefully. The verb he uses there, by the way, means to rest or to pause. So in other words, he put man in the garden, and the word put there means to rest or to pause. And Richard Davidson writes this. This is the term used in connection with God's resting on the Sabbath and human worship of God on that day. From Exodus 20.11 and Deuteronomy 5.14. And in particular, this verb refers to God's resting place in his sanctuary in the setting of worship. By shifting from one form of this word put to another, in Genesis 2.15, Moses is setting the tone for the worship-oriented interpretation of this verse with Adam and Eve as priests serving in the Eden sanctuary. Isn't it interesting that this sanctuary, God's dwelling place in Eden, was a place of what? It's a place of worship. And in particular... As Moses is giving us this account of Genesis and creation, he is bringing in God's rest and the what? The Sabbath as part of this act of God wanting to be with us and dwell with us and the act of there being people there to be with him and commune with him and also worship him. What you do here today when you come into this place this sanctuary place to worship God, to commune with Him, is something that God ordained in the very beginning of time in earth's first sanctuary. And the worship of God isn't just this prideful thing of God saying, I'm going to sit up on my mount here, my throne, my dwelling place, and all the people of the earth are going to come and they're going to bow down and they're going to worship me. Does that sound like the God we know? You know what? Jesus in the New Testament said something along these lines. If you want to know who God is, just look at who? Me. Because if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. This is the same Jesus who humbled himself and became the very lowest. When we talk about worship in the Bible, it isn't an act of pride in God's mind. It is a mutual experience when we come to worship God. It is mutual because we only come to worship Him. We only come to love Him because He first what? He first loved us. And He has demonstrated this by putting this sanctuary in the first earthly home of mankind saying, I want to be with you. I want to worship with you. Why do you come to church on Sabbath? Have a good Sabbath school class? Listen to a good sermon? 
It is. Or maybe uh, you don't come to listen to a good sermon. Maybe you come to find out what was wrong with the sermon. We come to church for a lot of different reasons, but God wants you here today because He wants to be with you. He wants to dwell with you. God wants you here today because He loves you. God wants you here today because He wants to worship with you. It's a mutual experience. Back in our Bibles here, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8, and in jumping to chapter 3 here, we are going to be going past a critical point in this earth's history because chapter 3 and verse 8 comes after Adam and Eve have sinned. We're going to be talking about the earthly sanctuary after sin next Sabbath, but we want to use this verse to point something out. Chapter 3 in Genesis, verse 8, and it says there, Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. That's not a very nice verse because we see somebody that used to want to be with God now what? Hiding from God. But it tells us something very important. What was God's custom to do every single day with his creation? Come and spend time with them to walk with them, to commune with them, to worship with them. That was God's practice. And it points out something that, again, gives us some very strong evidence to Genesis in the Garden of Eden being this first earthly sanctuary. In your Bibles, flip back to the last verse we're going to look at today. Leviticus chapter 26. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. So not too far from where you are. Chapter 26 and verses 11 and 12. Genesis chapter 26, and verses 11 and 12. And all, of all the evidence, I think this is probably my favorite because it gives us a really neat picture here of God. Leviticus 26, starting with verse 11. I will put my dwelling place among you, and I will not abhor you. I will mo- walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. So God says, I'm going to put my dwelling place among you, and I'm going to do what? I'm going to come down, and I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to spend time with you. I'm going to commune with you. And I will be your God, and you will be my what? People. Does that put a desire in your heart today? Wouldn't it be a cool thing to have experienced what Adam and Eve did and literally, physically be able to walk and commune with God? That's God's desire in his heart for all of us today. And it may be that we cannot do it in a physical sense at this point, but can you walk with God today? I pray that you are walking with God. I pray that you're experiencing communion with God. I pray that you're experiencing a true worship experience with God because that is what God desires for us today. That is what God has called us to because He loves us. So enough evidence for today. Pastor Jim, what does that even matter? 99% of the people reading through Genesis would never, ever even think about what we just talked about. Unless they had their concordance open, unless they were looking at every single verb and noun in Genesis, they're never going to stumble across the fact that this earthly Eden was earth's first sanctuary. So why bother? Aren't we taking things a little bit too far? What's the point of all of this? Is it even important to us today? Well, I will tell you it is critically important because this sanctuary that we have looked at today, this place of God's dwelling was prior to sin on this earth. And it tells us that God's desire to tabernacle with us, to dwell with us, was not a reaction to sin. It wasn't his response to sin. The sanctuary wasn't a creation meant to deal with sin. The sanctuary, first and foremost, its main purpose is that God wants to be with who? With you, because he loves you. 
and everything that we learn from the sanctuary throughout the rest of Scripture has to be built on that foundation. And for those poor souls that sit in their homes and wonder if they have done enough good to be in God's kingdom because of their understanding of the sanctuary, they need to know in their hearts today that that is not God, nor is that His sanctuary. God and His sanctuary is based on this and this alone, that God wants to be your God. He wants you to be His people. God wants to be with you. And His plan for His sanctuary is light years away from what it has become. I want to close with this statement from the book Patriarchs and Prophets. And listen very carefully to this first line. The home of our first parents was to be a pattern. A what? A pattern. Is that word familiar when we think about the sanctuary? It is, isn't it? The home of our first parents <clears throat> was to be a pattern for other homes as their children should go forth to occupy the earth. Understand the magnitude of that statement. The pattern of their first home, where God's first sanctuary on this earth was, where He came to dwell with His people, was to be the pattern of every home that was to come from Eden. And that includes your home today. Your home is to be a sanctuary where God can come and dwell with you. And even further, your heart is to be a sanctuary where God can come and dwell with you. Because that is God's ultimate desire for you. It is what He created you for, if so that you could be with Him. And anything in the sanctuary teaching that teaches anything other than that, my friends, we have went off track. Because that is God's design from the sanctuary from the very, very beginning. To be a pattern for our lives, our hearts, and our homes. Build me a sanctuary that I may dwell among you.